Seeing the documentary series The Turkic World Continuation about the most significant, in our opinion, states the Golden Horde's successes, which played an important role in the geopolitics of Eurasia in 15th to 18th centuries. We move towards ourselves, recognizing ourselves in others. Olzhaz Suleymanov. The founder of Uzbek's power was Sheban Prince Abu Kair, representatives of the three peoples about whom Uzbek Khan wrote, nominated him as the candidate for the Khan's throne. Let's remind Uzbek Khan's quotation, which was already cited in one of our episodes. Three people belong to the Uzbeks, who are the most glorious in Genghis Khan's possessions. To date, the first of them are all the tribes related to Sheiban. The second people are Kazakhs, who are famous for force and fearlessness in the whole world. And the third people are Mangids, who are Astrahan kings. One border of the Uzbeks area ends at the ocean. The other reaches Turkestan. The third one gets to Derbent the fourth one to Khorezm, and the fifth one to Astrobat. All these lands are entirely made up of the Uzbek summering and wintering grounds. The Khans of all these three peoples are at unvaried hostility against each other, and each of them encroaches on the other. Uzbek Khan is Fagani, the Book of Bukhara Guest. Intention of tribe leaders to stand under the banners of young and talented Prince Abu Kair was caused by a desire to create a powerful, mobile state of nomadic tribes. They really wanted Temurid's land, and they were not mistaken when electing their leader. Solemnly enthroned in 1428 in Tura on Urtish River, Abu Kair made this city his capital where his domination over the Uzbeks was strengthened and their Khans expressed complete submission and obedience to him. Immediately after accession to the throne, he seized from the other Juchis the whole former Ulus of this branch, located east of the river Ural and north of the Sirdaria. With the help of the above-mentioned tribes, Abu Kair began a war against Dashti Kipchak Khan Muhammad Hoja, who, according to a historian at that time, was one of the eminent sovereigns of his time, was known from Shah Rukh's history and was on friendly terms with him. Nevertheless, Muhammad Hoja was defeated on the Tobol banks, captured by Abu Kair and by his command put to death. Having joined Muhammad Hoja's possession to his Ulus, Abu Kair Khan returned to Tura. Similarly, in a very short time, between 1423 and 1431, Abu Kair Khan managed to bring together almost the whole Sheban Zulus and to exercise his authority over it. When Abu Khair, the Akorda, when Abu Kair came to power in Akorda state in 1428, he was very young. Before that, there were very complicated processes there, because Juchis of different lines were in a state of struggle for power. The Golden Horde was already passing into oblivion. At that time, it practically disintegrated. In Akorda also there was no stable power of Ordea Jens line, as it was before. Then Tokai Timurids interfered in the struggle for power. Sheiban's descendants also raised their numerous heads. They had small individual domains within Akorda. Abu Kair didn't come to power himself. Many leaders of clans and tribes recognized him. 
when the ruling dynasty changed in Akorda. From the hands of Ordejan's descendants, it passed into the hands of Sheiban's descendants. Then, by chance, the leaders of numerous tribes, Mongol, Turkified, and the Turkic tribes declared him the Khan. He was 17, 18 years old. His biography was well described by Masud bin Kuhistani in Tarihi Abul Khairi. He wrote Abul Khairi's biography on request of his grandson Muhammad Shaybani at the time of his political power. Abul Khair was born in the year of the dragon in 1412. He opened early. He had to be in service of Shiban's another descendant, Jumaduk Khan, and to participate in his struggle for supreme power in the steppe. Sixteen-year-old Abul Khair Oglan was captured, and by Mangid B's decision, he was released. Masud bin Osmani Kuhistani, the history of Abul Khair Khan. In 1431, Abul Khan undertook a great campaign against Khorezm. The people of Khorezm capital Urgenj, seeing that they could not defend the city and not wishing to suffer horrors of carnage of the nomads, decided to show submission to the Uzbeks. The peaceful delegation sent by citizens to Abul Khair was well treated by him and Khan had mercy upon the city and its inhabitants. But it was necessary to somehow reward the army which provided such a rich city. In this regard, Abul Khair Khan's son, Su Yun Chi, later told the author of Abul Khair Khan's story. My father, after conquering Khorezm, ordered to open the treasury that the former rulers had collected with such difficulty and care, and ordered two his emirs, among the great ones, to sit down at the doors of the treasury and all commanders, people of the Khan's retinue and ordinary soldiers would enter it by two, taking the amount they could easily take and going out. In accordance with this Khan's order, all military entered the treasury, everybody took as much as he could take away and left therefrom. As a result, on Khan's mercy, the army enriched itself with gold and precious stones. Although Abul Khair Khan had to leave Khorezm soon due to the plague epidemic and to return hastily to the expenses of his native steppes, nevertheless his ambitious desire to subordinate new areas to his power and his greatness forced the Khan to turn attention to the possessions of Juchis, Mahmud Khan and Ahmed Khan, who defied him and showed hostility. At a big meeting of Uzbek tribes' leaders, subject to Abul Khair, it was decided to march against the above-mentioned Khans to their headquarters in Ikri Tur area, located apparently somewhere in the Sirdaria steppes. Almost all the emirs with their tribes who were mentioned at the beginning of Abul Khair's rules took part in this campaign. The Khans were defeated and hardly escaped with a precipitate flight and the winners got rich booty. The victory afforded Abul Khair the opportunity to seize the capital of Dashti Kipchak nomads or Du Bazar, where Batu Khan's headquarters was located at one time. Here, after saying a prayer to the glory of Abul Khair and stamping coins with his name, all the tribal heads who took part in the campaign were awarded horses, camels and other cattle, new tents, combat armor and weapons, and ordinary warriors, various gifts. According to historiographers, Ordu Bazar people were given a place under the shade of Khan's patronage and provided other favors and propagation of justice, as well as arms of tyrants and aggressors were shortened. 
это как бы право выступать в качестве человека, упорядочивающего хозяйственное торговое обращение, да, имело значительную роль. The right of stamping coins, the right to act as a person, regulated economic circulation, played a significant role in legitimizing power. Скажем так, находится на зимних качеях, когда мы говорим о об оазисах юга, да, либо это там по Сердарье, либо это в Прикаспе, да, либо это в Причерноморье, да, вот. There was a struggle for Orda Bazaar, the nomadic Kenyan capital, that is nomadic city, which in winter was a wintering ground. We talk about the southern bases in the Sirdarya region, near the Caspian Sea or the Black Sea region. And in summer they went to Jailau, summer pasture, and may have been somewhere in woods in the Urals in Siberia. That is, Orda Bazaar was a nomadic city. There was a mint where a Tamga clan sign was put on a gold bullion on one side and a Shahada symbol of faith was put on the other side. The Tamga emphasized the right to rule on the strength of the origin, both Muslims and Christians, by virtue of kinship with Byzantine emperors. Possession of Orda Bazaar, that is the center of stamping coins, possession of the cities as an economic factor, and these key important cities which supplied military contingent of the Tatars, subjects liable for military service, created these factors of stability of the political system and statehood which we see through the prism of the Sunni political legal doctrine. While Mangir Demir, Yedegei's son Mansur, took active and apparently constant participation in Barak Khan's activities, Yedegei's grandson, Vakas B, played an important role in Abul Kair's prominence. Young Khan at first was in great friendship with Nur ad-Din's son, Vakas B. Masud bin Osmani Kuhistani, The History of Abul Kair Khan. Nomadic tribes of Dashti Kipchak in the 15th century were still strong with their tribal organization, led by a steppe feudal aristocracy – Khans, Sultans, Oglans, Bahadurs, Beks, etc. The first three groups were Genghisids, in other words, people of white bone. As for the others, they were representatives of the local tribal aristocracy, that is, members of the top of black bone. Expansion of Abul Kair Khan's sphere of power and influence caused dissatisfaction of individual tribal leaders, especially those who strived for separation and settlement of this situation required special attention from the Khan. Therefore, for the next 15 years, Abul Kair Khan didn't wage major wars in order to expand his possessions, but was engaged in an intrastate structure. And now I'll tell you an episode typical for that time – relations of former friends. Let me remind you that Vokas, Yedegei's grandson, did much to support young Abul Kayur. And then this Mangit's leader Vokas Beg, having united with Step Khan Mustafa, rebelled against Abul Kayur with his tribe. But Abu Kair Khan, supported by the tribal leaders, defeated the rebels in battle on the banks of Adbasar, put them to flight. About four and a half thousand rebels were killed, their property, livestock, wives and children, with all their relatives and dependent people, fell into the hands of Abu Kair Khan's warriors. All this was calculated and divided between emirs, leaders and ordinary battle participants, depending on the situation of each of them. In the mid-40s of the 15th century, Abul Kair Khan resumed his campaigns, undertaking a march to the south of Orda's former Ulus fortress Signak, relying on his supporters, among whom were also the Mangids, with their rebellious leader Vokas Beg, who had reconciled with Abul Kair by that time. 
Signak surrendered to the Uzbeks leader voluntarily, followed by seizing Sirdarya fortresses such as Akurgan, Arkuk, Suzak. All of them were handed out to the management of loyal people. Thus, Abul Kayur took away from Temurid's fortified cities on the Sirdarya from Signak to Uzgend. According to Barthel, Signak was declared the capital by the Khan. In the beginning, when he formed the state of nomadic Uzbeks in 1428, the capital was in Western Siberia in Tura city. And while he was subordinating numerous tribes of Eastern Dashti Kipchak to his power, Orda Bazar city became the capital, which is closer to the Golden Horde capital. According to sources, they managed to seize the Golden Horde throne for some time, but his ambitions were not to be the ruler in the disintegrating Golden Horde, but to unite Eastern Dashti Kipchak under his power. He succeeded. Then he took possession of Sirdarya region. And this was the apogee of his rule, because this region, Sirdarya region, including cities of the middle and lower reaches of the Sirdarya, was a tasty morsel for all state formations before and after. It was an economically advantageous region, a border between the nomadic world and the settled one. There was trade. They exchanged their products. And where there is trade, there is economic prosperity. In addition, this is a strategically important point. There, Timurids erected fortresses, which at the time could withstand a long siege. At that time, it was difficult to draw a border, and these were ready-made borders, well fortified city fortresses. Moreover, there were good summer pastures in this region, because on the Sirdaria banks there were very thick reed underbrushes, and there were ready winter pastures where cattle could hide from the winter weather. He seized Signak and made it his capital. Everything was good in the state of nomadic Uzbeks, until they were attacked by the Kalmyks. How came of the city, Signak, when he saw numerousness and majesty of the army of Abul Kair Khan of Hakan, came to him with obedience and submission and handed over the city to emirs and servants of Abul Kair Khan of Hakan, looking like Jupiter and Akurgan, Arkuk, Suzak and Durgen also became possession of power and conquests of his governors. Masud bin Osmani Kuhistani, The History of Abul Kair Khan Abul Kair Khan for the first time officially intervened in Temurid's dynastic strife, responding to the request of Timur's great-grandson Sultan Abu Said Mirza 1451-1469 to help him enthrone in Samarkand and successfully played this card. Abul Qair's troops invaded Murwarana and thus helped Temurid Abu Said to take the throne of Samarkand in 1451. This facilitated Abul Qair Khan's power to reach the height. His state already stretched from Tobolsk area to the Sirdarya. However, the triumph was not long. In 1457, Oirats or Kalmyks invaded Abul Kair Khan's area. The Kalmyks moved to Abul Kair Khan's Ulusses from the Chu River. Kalmyks Khan Oz Timur inflicted a heavy defeat on Abul Kair Khan's army near Kok Kesene and completely plundered the entire northern shore of the Sirdarya. Abul Kair Khan took shelter inside the walls of Signak, where he was forced to conclude peace with the Kalmyks on the terms of the victors. The Kalmyks army left beyond the Chu, and Abul Kair Khan, for a long time, had to get in order his lands, badly damaged by this war. It should be noted that the feudal nobility supported the Khan only if he conducted an active foreign policy and victorious wars, otherwise it often left him. The defeat of Abul Kair Khan's army significantly imploded his reputation. It was the clash of the Uzbeks with the Kalmyks in 
That was one of the serious reasons that led to the fall of the Uzbek Khanate of nomadic tribes. At that time, the borders of the nomadic Uzbek Khanate stretched in the north to Tura, in the south to the Aral Sea and the lower Sirdarya, including the western part of Khorezm. Its eastern border passed in Sauram, and in the west it bordered the Yaik River. In a way, this state included the most part of present-day Kazakhstan, western Siberia and southwestern Khorezm. On the middle reaches of the Sirdarya, there were such large cities as Yassi, Turkestan, Otrar, Signak, Sauran, Arkuk, Akurgan, etc., which up until the 17th century remained the centers of trade between nomadic and settled people of Deshti Kipchak and Mavorana. When Ustimur Taishi heard that Abul Qayyar Khan had gathered great treasure, he ordered the warriors to clean up their weapons and to come to his court. When the horde reached the Ili river banks, Abul Qayyar's army also went forth. Both of the two armies met and mingled. The dust from the hoofs rose up in the air and the blood poured down from swords, axes and arrows through the steppe, but then the wind of victory blew from the Kalmax. Abul Qayyar Khan was forced to retreat and to take shelter inside the walls of Signak. Without encountering resistance, from there the victors entered the vicinity of Turkestan, Tashkent and Tahruhiya, committed murder, violence, plunder and captivity everywhere, took away everything they had captured. Before leaving, Ustimur Taishi concluded peace with Abul Qayyar. Masud bin Osmani Kuhistani. The troops of nomadic Uzbeks basically retained the system and the principle that were under Genghis Khan. First of all, it was a tribal militia collected from all possessions, and under Khans and tribal leaders there were always only a few hundred nukers, bodyguards. The latter were not only warriors, but they also performed various works in the youths of their masters. During campaigns, Uzbeks gave serious attention to reconnaissance and Uzbek Khans widely practiced espionage. Abul Qayyar's actions and creation of a strong Uzbek state of nomadic tribes caused migration of nomads, their departure from native steppes to foreign lands, captivity during military operations. In this regard, it is interesting that the desire to prevent anarchy in using even vast pastures for centuries has established the custom of movement by societies of only one clan, admitting to their kishlaks on the relatives through female lineage from other clans or the poor who became employed as workers. And that's why even the ways of nomadic movements were determined for each tribe, and each tribe had its own certain places for winter camps, summer and autumn migration. For example, a scout of a tribe finding a well that wasn't occupied by anybody placed a special sign around it, a spear or thing, or he drew a thumb of his tribe on the ground or put a tight tuft on grass near it. Seeing such a sign, others didn't choose this place for their camp. When the leader of a nomadic society chose a place without marking it with the sign and left to see other places, and on his return found that a leader of another tribe had taken this place, the claim of the first wasn't taken into account. The bottom line is that Abul Qayyar failed to reconcile the nomads' hereditary principles with the semi-nomadic empire system centered in Signak. 
The beginning of the split from Abu Kair was laid by his two vessels, who came from the house of Juchi, Kirei, and Janibek. They left him and asked for allotments from Chagatai Khan Yesen Bukar II, who allotted them lands on the borders of Mogulistan. And this fact was only the first step in the global split of the state. Their cultural doctrine was the same, but the political doctrine was different. Dominance of dynasties was either based on Sultanate Genghisism or based on Nogai Genghisism, that is, self-government, black bone, with muscle huts, etc. This was another doctrine. The contradiction didn't go anywhere. There was a muscle cut in the Nogai horde when under Yesim Khan the Nogais entered the Kazakhanate as the junior Jews after the Nogai horde was defeated. They didn't remove their traditions anywhere. They just renegotiated and the Nogais entered as the junior Jews. By itself, the doctrine for some time due to influence of such a leader as Abul Kair, may not have been so important. But as soon as an authoritative, charismatic leader left, the contradictions came to the surface again. After Abul Kair Khan's death, in Uzbek Ulus such turmoil arose that the steppe inhabitant, for his safety and well-being, sought refuge at Karai Khan and Janibek Khan so that the latter strengthened. And since in the beginning they, and after that many others, having fled, separated, and for some time were poor people and wanderers, they were called Kazakhs. And this nickname followed them and was established. Haidar Mirza, Babur's cousin. In 1465-1466, a lot of nomadic clans, subjects of Abu Hai Khan, joined Kire and Janibek, that is, they became essentially independent. Since then, these nomads separated from the Uzbek Khanate began to be called Kazakhs, adventurers, rebels. Their separation was a great historical event if we take into account the vast territory that they occupied and which was later settled by their descendants. Departure of nomadic Uzbeks from the Uzbek Khanate played an extremely important role in formation of the Kazakh people. There was a historical meeting of the emerging nationality with its future name. Tursun Sultanov. Looking ahead, it should be noted that after conquest of Temurid state by Sheibanids in the early 16th century, and after migration of about 300,000 Uzbeks to Moborana, there was, according to Yedege Marsanov and other scientists, a transfer of the ethnonym Uzbek from Eastern Desh to Kipchak to Central Asia. The Uzbeks, who remained in the territory of present-day Kazakhstan, began to be called Uzbek Kazakhs, and later simply Kazakhs. After that, Heterogeneous groups of nomads entered the Kazakh people for the 16th century. They were formerly part of the Mangits, Mongols, Shabanids, etc. The ethnonym Kazakh gradually embraced the whole array of Turkic speaking tribes of nomads who lived in the territory of Kazakhstan. Abul Khair Khan's Khanate wasn't a temporary union of nomads. The presence of government officials, divans, tax system and stamping coins with the name of the Khan, who was the head of state, all these statehood attributes testify that it was not a temporary nomadic union, but a patriarchal feudal state, although not centralized. Its political disintegration after Abul Khair Khan's death 
was temporary and soon, since the 90s of the 15th century, was replaced by a new political association, from which arose the Uzbek state, led by Muhammad Shaybani Khan, and the Kazakh state, with Burundik Khan. Where Abulkar Khan failed, his descendants succeeded.